In this part of the Earth in Upheaval series, we will cover the chapter of the Caves of England. Here Velikovsky shows how many different species are found in caves of England and Europe, and it seems to indicate that they were deposited there by flood water, and secondly that the types of animals found come from very different climates. Velkovsky once more uses Cuvier to discuss some of the remarkable finds in some of the caves of Europe. Referring to Cuvier's essay on the theory of the earth, we find this. Bears are rare occurrences in alluvial strata. Remains of the largest species of the caves are said, however, to have been found in Austria and Hainau, and in Tuscany there are bones of a particular species remarkable for its compressed canine teeth. The hyenas are more frequently met. We have remains of them in France, found along with bones of elephants and rhinoceroses. A cave has lately been discovered in England, which contains prodigious quantities of them, where they were found of every age and of which the soil presents even their excrements in a sufficient state of preservation to be easily recognised. It would appear that they had long lived there and that it had been by them that bones of elephants, rhinoceros, hippopotami, horses, oxen, deer, and various animals of the class of gliars which are found along with them, and which bear evident marks of their teeth, had been dragged into the cave. But what must have been the solid of England when these enormous animals lived upon it and constituted the prey of ferocious beasts? These caves contain also bones of tigers, wolves, and foxes, but the remains of bears are excessively rare occurrences in them. These are the principal animals, the remains of which have been found in the mass of earth, sand and mud, that diluvium which everywhere covers our large plains, fills our caverns and chokes up the fissures of many of our rocks. They incontestably form the population of the continents at the epoch of the great catastrophe which has destroyed their races, and which has prepared the soil on which the animals of the present day subsist. The term diluvian comes from one of Cuvier's sources, William Buckland's Reliquae Diluvianae. He was the Vice President of the Geographical Society of London and Professor of Mineralogy and Geology at the Oxford University. Buckland defines the term as follows. As I shall have frequently occasion to make use of the word diluvium, it may be necessary to premise that I apply it to those extensive and general deposits of superficial loam and gravel which appear to have been produced by the last great convolution that has affected our planet, and that with regard to the indication afforded by geology of such a convolution, I entirely coincide with the views of M. Cuvier in considering them as bearing undeniable evidence of a recent and transient inundation. On these grounds I have felt myself fully justifiable in applying the epithet diluvial to the results of this great convulsion, of antediluvial to the state of things immediately preceding it, and postdiluvial or alluvial to that which succeeded it, and has continued to the present time. The first part of his work is devoted to the Kirkdale Cave in Yorkshire. This cave hosts a plethora of bones from numerous species, several of which are not native to Britain. These include the hippopotamus, the elephant, the rhinoceros, bear, tiger, and the hyena. This pointed to the idea that these animals died elsewhere and had been swept into the cave by floodwaters. When Buckland visited the cave, he concluded that these animals must have been native to Britain in some remote epoch, that their bones had been scavenged by hyenas and dragged into the caves. Subsequent flooding had covered them with a diluvial loam. This flood had then transformed the land to such an extent that these species could no longer survive in this part of the world. We can clearly see a trail that led Velikovsky from Cuvier to Buckland. Although Buckland had very different views on the origin of the animals to Velikovsky and Cuvier, all were in agreement that some catastrophic event had transformed the landscape in the very recent past. Buckland summarises as follows. At present I am concerned only to establish two important facts. First, that there has been a recent and general inundation of the globe, 
and second, that the animals whose remains are found interred in the wreck of the inundation were natives of high northern latitudes, and not drifted to their present place from equatorial regions by the waters that caused their destruction. One thing, however, is nearly certain, that if any change of climate has taken place, it took place suddenly, for how otherwise could the elephant's carcass found entire in the ice at the mouth of the Lena have been preserved from putrefaction till it was frozen up with the waters of the then existing ocean? Nor is it less probable that this supposed change was contemporaneous with and produced by the same cause which brought on the inundation. What this cause was, whether a change in the inclination of Earth's axis, or the near approach of a comet, or any other cause or combination of causes, purely astronomical, is a question the discussion of which foreign to the object of the present memoir. Velikovsky also quotes from a number of other sources to demonstrate the widespread distribution of caves across Europe with strange collections of bones. He quotes William Boyd Dawkins, who was a geologist and archaeologist. Velikovsky cites his 1969 paper on the distribution of the British post-glacial mammals. In this paper, Dawkins catalogues the various types of animals discovered across a number of different cave finds. Velikovsky uses Dawkins to support the following claims. It appeared that hippopotamus and reindeer and bison lived side by side at Kirkdale. Hippopotamus, reindeer and mammoths pastured together at Brentford near London. Reindeer and grizzly bear lived with hippopotamus at Keffen in Wales. Lemmings and reindeer bones were found together with the bones of cave lions and hyena at Bleedon in Somerset. In this document, Dawkins also references James Geeky, who was the Professor of Geology at the University of Edinburgh for over 30 years. Velgovsky cites him directly when discussing the presence of early humans alongside these exotic animals in glacial Britain. After a considerable accumulation of such deposits has taken place, many feet or even yards in depth, the river might again gradually undermine and rearrange them. The gravel would be pushed along and come to rest further away, and so would it be with the sand and silt. Any animal remains, such as bones or teeth, which these older deposits may have contained, would in like manner be rolled along and embedded in another position. This in a series of fluviatile strata like the Pleistocene gravels and sands. It is often quite impossible to tell whether the animal remains that lie side by side in the same stratum belong to the species that were exactly contemporaneous in the sense of occupying the same country at the same time. Later on, he discusses human remains. An exhaustive examination of the gravels and loam in a number of valleys in the north of France and the south of England enabled this geologist to demonstrate that they had been formed by river action. From these old river drifts, flint implements of undeniable human workmanship have been obtained in large numbers and associated with them. In the same undisturbed strata of sand and gravel, numerous remains of Pleistocene mammalia have been found. There can be no doubt, therefore, that man and his congeners, the extinct and no longer indigenous mammalia, were in joint occupation of France and southern England during deposition of the ancient valley deposits whose origins we are now considered. Velikovsky also cites a second document from Dawkins called Cave Hunting, published in 1874. In this paper, he lists the animals discovered across a number of different finds, and here he clearly lists man alongside a variety of exotic animals. He also states, The discovery of a flint flake in the undisturbed lower brick earths at Crayford by Reverend O. Fisher in the presence of the writer in April 1872 proves that man was living while these fluviatile strata were being deposited. He then quotes Edouard Lotet, who was a French geologist and paleontologist. He explored the caves of Perigord in southern France. He worked on a document which had originally been started by an amateur geologist, Henry Christie, who financed part of the exploration. In France, we have found the hippopotamus in only one cavern, that of Arce, where it was noticed by the engineer Bonnard who placed the specimen in our Museum of Natural History. 
De Vibray found afterwards in the same cavern of Arce numerous remains of reindeer, accompanied by worked flint, and in the lowest layer a human jaw, associated with numerous remains of the great bear, the elephant, rhinoceros, and hyena. Although not directly cited by Velikovsky, we find more information on these caves in Henry Howarth's The Mammoth and the Flood, which we have covered in previous episodes. It has in the first place been argued that the animals did not live at the same time, but mark successive stages during the Pleistocene age. This view has chiefly prevailed on the contingent that it has been favoured by a school of inquirers in England, of which James Gickey is the head. In France, students have supported the notion of a succession of stages marked by the presence of certain characteristic animals or absence of others. In England, the argument has been in favour of a number of temperate eras intercalated between a number of Arctic ones, or, in fact, a number of interglacial periods. The continental theories most favoured are those of M. Dupont and M. Lotet, the one separating the Pleistocene Age into the Mammoth and Reindeer period, and the other into those of the Cave Bear, Mammoth, Reindeer and Bison. What do these facts say? Cuvier, whose prejudices were the other way, was long ago constrained to write of the remains of reindeer found with those of Mammoth and Rhinoceros in the caves of Brugge. There is no doubt that the rhinoceros was buried by the reindeers in Brugge. His bones were there in a jumble, with those of the great quadruped, wrapped in the same red earth and partly covered with the same stalactite. And therein lies the riddle. Uniformitarians would suggest that these different species lived at different times, but the cave findings would indicate that these species were somehow entombed at the same time together. Equally, it could be that the climate underwent a sudden and dramatic change from tundra to subtropical within a very short period of time, but the question would still remain, how could they have colonised Britain in such a short period of time? The fact that the climate of Britain has undergone some very dramatic and sudden changes in a very short period of time is something that is accepted by mainstream academia and this picture is also seen elsewhere across the globe. So here we have the potential evidence of a sudden and dramatic climate change, and yet more evidence of mass flooding which has entombed a variety of unlikely species together in the same place in these caves. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time. 